please, for Alan, Dr. Alan Schlesinger. I want to thank you, Joel, and I want to thank Kelly Zuniga, CEO of Holocaust Museum Houston, and Carl Joshart, board chair, for having us here tonight. Dr. Alan Schlesinger's new book, Resilience, the story of how my father survived the Holocaust, is a wonderful embrace of history. But beyond that, it's also, and I quote from your foreword, it's an amazing triumph of gratitude and forgiveness over anger and resentment. In his book, Al tells the story of his father Joe's three-year journey of survival, which included 17 months of forced labor on the Eastern Front, followed by deportation to Auschwitz, where he survived for six months before spending, get this, an additional four months in five other concentration camps. Then following his escape to Germany, Joe Schlesinger lived for four years as a displaced person, or DP, at a DP camp in Germany where he met Al's mother. And then they immigrated to the US where he was officially designated the 10,000th DP to arrive in the States. You'll hear about that a little later. The stories Al will share with you are laced with really powerful synchronicity. A word described this way by Joseph Jaworski in the book of the same name. In Jaworski's words, he says, we've all had those perfect moments when things come together in an almost unbelievable way, when events that could never be predicted, let alone controlled, remarkably seem to guide us along our path. So tonight, you're going to hear about two paths, the path of Al's father, Joe, and the path of Al, that brought him and his book to you tonight. Al, it's really great to, and quite fun to be here on this stage with you. We typically see each other walking our dogs in the neighborhood, and that's how we met. And in fact, we like to say that it's Millie and Steli, our dogs, that, that made this night really happen. So uh, why don't we start with, of course, we have to get the shout out to the dogs, right? <laughs> But talk about going back to you were like five or six years old, the journey, the steps that brought you here and your book tonight. Yes, it, when I was about four or five years old, I don't really remember exactly when, um, that was when I first heard from a neighbor's child that uh, my parents had been in jail. And I was very upset by that. And I went home crying and my father um, consoled me and asked me what, why I was so upset and I told him that you and mom were in jail, and he told me, no, no, it was something very, very different. We were prisoners, but we were not bad people, and, and, I, and I think that uh, that's my first memory. And later on, when I was in school and learned about the history of World War II, I asked him many times to share his story, but he was always hesitant. But sometime when I was in high school or college, I can't remember exactly when, because I lived at home in college, so somewhere in that seven year period, probably when I was about 20, he sat one, down one day and said, you've asked me so many times, now I'm gonna tell you a lot of stories of what happened. And it was just a series of stories and I didn't have real the, the, the entire historical framework, but I knew these stories. And these stories were rattling around in my brain for 50 years and I always thought I should, I should write them down someday. Um, when my father had passed away in 1990, but in 2010, when we moved my mother here to Houston to be in an assisted living facility, cleaning out her house, I found a lot of documents related to his time in the war because as part of the reparations program that the German government had, um, they uh, asked people to uh, put in a claim, but then needed a lot of um, supporting information. His lawyer had asked him many, many questions. And, and I, I didn't have time to read them then. I was trying to clean up their house. And I realized these are very important. And I saved those and brought them home. I, did, I skimmed them, but didn't really look at the details. And then in 2020, when I retired, um, I, I said, now's the time I should probably write, write my dad's memoir. I had a little trouble getting started. You know, COVID made everybody a little bit um, tired of uh, and made people uh, hesitant to start new projects because they were just trying to feel their way through the, the pandemic. But I got spurred on by a couple of events. One was two events here at the Holocaust Museum that were virtual uh, uh, presentations. I saw Moshe Vardy's talk about the history of the Hungarian Holocaust, and I saw Jim Lomason's talk about 
um, stories of survival and photographs and stories of what people brought from genocide, not just the Holocaust, all kinds of genocide. And of course, then when Steli and Millie met, and, uh, and we, you became friends with my wife and I, my wife is right here with my daughter, um, you, uh, you asked me what I did, and I told you I had just retired, and you asked me what I was going to do in retirement, and I said, well, I've always planned on writing this book, and then you gave me some encouragement, and not just encouragement, but also um, you were able to uh, present some of the material to the people here at the Holocaust Museum, and and, and I feel like that, that really made a lot of this happen. Um, another thing is that between the time when I first thought I should write these down almost 50 years ago, and now the internet, of course, developed. And so it's sort of a blessing in disguise that I didn't do anything till 2020, because by then I had found all these lost documents that had incredible detail that took a bunch of stories that were just unrelated and gave them a historical context and helped them fit helped me fill in a lot of the information. And then the internet was a tremendous way to find out some more information. And so I'm convinced that my procrastinating for 50 years paid off. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it does pay off, yeah. doesn't it? Well, let's meet Al's father, Joe Schlesinger. And Al has a slide to help you understand Dr. Schlesinger. The other Dr. Schlesinger's life is a chronology of it. So Al, yeah. run us through that. Well, my father was uh, only. Um, child. He was born into a secular Hungarian Jewish family. His father was a physician, and he became a physician, and they had a practice together. Um, he had the opportunity to escape early in the war because uh, he, he had heard um, about what, what was likely to happen because of what had happened in the other countries close by. Hungary was one of the last uh, to be involved in the Holocaust. Um, and the British Espionage Service... Uh, approached him and other people, including one of his friends, and asked them, to, uh, and asked them if they wanted to be taken out of Hungary and be uh, trained as spies and then come back. Uh, his friend decided to do that, but he decided not to because he was an only child. He, despite the fact that he knew that he probably couldn't do anything to help his family, his parents, he didn't want to leave them. So um, um, he was right because a few months later he was taken as a forced laborer and he spent 17 months in forced labor, as you mentioned, in, um, in Russia as the, the Nazis uh, invaded Russia and then were eventually driven out of Russia. So those 17 months were the worst 17 months to be, a, uh, to be in, in Russia as a forced laborer. There were 5,000 in his group and somewhere between 30 and 50 survived. The rest did not survive. Um, about six or seven months after returning from, the, from uh, Russia, he uh, was in fact deported with his parents to Auschwitz. And um, then as the Russian army was approaching from the east and liberating um, Poland, um, he was among many of the, um, the prisoners in the, in the uh, concentration camp who were moved further west towards the heart of Germany, eventually ending up in Nordhausen, where he worked um, on the underground, uh, building underground facilities to build the V-2 rockets. Um, eventually he escaped in, during a British bombing raid and he made his way to the American zone. He realized from his time in Russia he did not want to be in the Russian, uh, he didn't want to be liberated by the Russians. And he ended up in the American zone spending three or four weeks uh, hiding and traveling west. And then he was in a displaced persons camp there for four years where he met my mother made many lifelong friends, not just um, friends with uh, other DPs, uh, but also with American soldiers, and eventually came to the United States in 1949. And one of those soldiers, Dr. Herbert Lichtman, was very instrumental in helping him mm -hmm. come to the United States. He and his parents sponsored my, my family, to, right. my parents to come. Dr. Lichtman pops up a lot during your book. You'll hear more about him later. <clears throat> and it's worth noting, too, that when... Joe and his parents went to Auschwitz. His parents did perish right away. Yes, they quickly. went to the gas chambers right away. So in the 17 months, it's something we, when we met with Carl before this plan, we had a planning meeting, Carl pointed out something really insightful. You always hear about the Holocaust, but you don't often hear about 
the before and the after, and the before in this case was Joe's 17 months in the forced labor camps and the after in the DP camps. We'll talk about that. But there's something really that stands out for me in the book during his 17 months in the forced labor camp. Those months seemed as miraculous as his journey in the camps themselves. And you write about a couple of stories, I think you're going to share one with us, that um, it talks, speaks to your dad's survival being a combination of good instincts and good fortune. Can you share one of those stories from the yeah, book? Yeah, I, I'll, I'd like to read that from the book. He, he always stressed to me, when he talked to me about it, I wanted to add also that, except for talking to me those few days, when I was around 20, he never talked about it afterwards either. He, um, he rarely mentioned the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I remember him saying very clearly that um, you never knew what was going to save your life, whether it was luck or whether it was um, street skills and uh, street smarts. So, um, so the first story, um, there, there are two related stories. I'll only read the first. So the first story described an event when he was assigned to clean the latrines at the site where the laborers were camped. This is in Russia during the winter. It was, very, it was a very cold day, and he saw soldiers directing many of the forced laborers into a horse stable. He thought that was distinctly unusual, as the laborers were rarely allowed access to the limited shelter available, which was typically reserved for the Hungarian army soldiers. He was concerned that there might be a bad outcome for those prisoners. Thinking quickly, he told the soldier who had ordered him to clean the latrines that he needed help and he pointed to one of the other laborers close by and said, give me him to help me. The soldier agreed and told the other prisoner that he should help my father clean the latrines. Once the soldier left them to their job, the other prisoner was very hostile and very angry with my father, not realizing that my father was trying to save him from what his instincts told him could be a very dangerous situation. Within minutes, the stables had been locked and set on fire by the Hungarian soldiers. My father's survival was the result of pure luck because he was randomly assigned to clean the latrines. But the other prisoner was the beneficiary of my father's good instincts that predicted the horror that was about to happen. His presence of mind to ask for help in order to save the, another prisoner and his willingness to take a chance of being punished by asking the soldier for help. I learned years later from other documents that I found in, in my father's papers that many of the laborers who had been burned alive had been sick with typhus, and the Hungarian army chose to murder them rather than, than to continue to provide them medical care. Yeah, and that's a visually gripping story. And it's also a good example of the research you mentioned at the beginning, where you had heard these stories from your father, and then combined with your checking on the internet and research, you dot connected the stories with the timeline to, vet, to verify that's and, right. And right. Talk about that. All I really knew was that story, that, that he had saved this other prisoner, he had been saved by his good fortune, and that, that the building was set, the stable was set on fire. I didn't know where or when that happened. I didn't know um, the extent of the atrocity, how many people. I didn't know if they were all Hungarian Jews. I didn't know if they were other Jews, or if they were non-Jewish forced laborers. I, I didn't know. And as I mentioned in these documents that I found, um, one document was written to the lawyer, and my father said, in response to your question about precisely where I had been during the time in Russia, um, I can give you these dates and these locations. And he specifically said, because I don't speak Russian, many of these may not be correctly spelled. So I thought, having the internet, I'll check the spelling. And I just put each one into Google, and half the time it was correctly spelled, and I found a lot of hits on that town. And the other times it said, did you mean, and then gave the, the correct spelling. And just by chance, when I put in the town Doroshichi, just meaning to check the spelling, I noticed that the first hit talked about an atrocity that occurred there where 300 to 800 hun Hungarian Jews were killed on April 29th. And I thought, that's exactly the story my father told me. So then I went back to the timeline I knew he had been a Doroshichi. Now by reading about Doroshichi, I knew that there was an atrocity just like my father described that happened there. So I checked the dates, and that's exactly when my father was there. So now I knew, in a way I would have never have known before the internet and before those found documents, right. exactly where that event was. And then I had more detail to put in the book about wow. it. Wow. 
So anyone who's out there wanting to or has done some research on your own family's history, if you haven't done it yet, maybe there's a reason, right? Okay, now fast forwarding into your dad's life in the DP or displaced persons camp. In your book, you write, and through this photo, and by the way, this book is full of wonderful photos in the back. Uh, this is a picture of the DP camp where, where Al's father, Joe, and then his mother were. And you paint a really vivid picture of both the physical and the life of the people in it. Actually, this isn't actually the camp, but this is the town. The town. The town. But um, yes, it, it, it just such a beautiful, idyllic scene um, on the river with the mountains in the background. And I just can't imagine, I mean, it looks so idyllic to me now. I can't imagine what it looked like to my father, who yeah. days before had been um, on the run trying to be liberated by the Americans, and, and just weeks before had been in, in Nordhausen concentration camp. So it, 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 it's really interesting to me um, to, to have learned a little bit about the DP camps. I found two sources that were helpful. One is, of course, the internet. Um, and the other was uh, Dr. Lichtman actually had a, uh, I found a draft of an incomplete, an incomplete draft of an unpublished memoir of his in my mother's house when I was cleaning that house. And he had incredible detail about the life in the DP camp because he served from 46 to 47. So he was there after the war, but during the time of the DP camps. And from my research and from his memoir, Many of, the, many of the prisoners, or re recent prisoners now, refugees, were very malnourished. The American army uh, directed the camps. Um, they were often in old um, army barracks or old schools, wherever they could find a place to, to, to house these people. And it really was not a very um, ideal situation at first, but eventually the United Nations uh, became involved, took over the control from the army, and was able to really improve the situation for, for the displaced persons. Um, initially, um, repatriation was the initial plan. And that was quite easy if somebody had merely been displaced, had a place to go home to, and they just needed transportation. And the army provided that. But there were other people who had a much um, more difficult problem. They did want to go back. They had a place to go back. But now their old hometown was in a different country because borders had been changed. So they were no longer a citizen of the country that their home was uh, located in. So they had to do a lot of um, uh, legal um, activity to get those people repatriated. But most of the Jews who had survived the death camps um, either couldn't go back, their family had been killed, their property had been taken by neighbors, they had nothing to go back to, or they didn't want to go back. And they knew there was still a lot of uh, rampant uh, uh, anti-Semitism. And much of that was learned by the DPs when certain DPs arrived in the camp who had tried to go home first and found out that there was nothing to go home to. My mother was one of those people, and she came to the DP camp after trying to go home. So, Initially, the camps were not very well run, but then they eventually learned how to make, uh, make it a much more sustainable uh, situation. And under the United Nations, they separated the Jewish people into Jewish camps, and they separated the non-Jews who were displaced into other camps based on ethnicity and nationality. And that's when, the, in the Jewish camps, which I did much of my research on, that's when they began to thrive. They had self-government. Um, they, people were reunited, people met each other for the first time, um, schools were started, and, uh, and many weddings happened in, in those DP camps. So there's a whole history of the life in DP camps, which lasted till 1951, that's really not that well known wow. about. That's not long ago, really, yeah. in the scheme of things. So you yeah. talk about those silver linings, the friendships, the marriages that yeah. occurred as a result, and you talk a lot about the friendship with Dr. Herb Lichtman, who was so important in your family's life. Yeah, this is my father and Dr. Lichtman. And um, he was very, very important to my parents. He, um, he was a young Jewish doctor who had finished internship uh, a few weeks before. He got sent in the army to, in 1946 to be in charge of 10,000 army soldiers in immediate post-war Germany in the town of Eschwege. And my father, who was a 
experienced physician who was several years older than him and had been practicing. He, my father, when he got to the DP camp, immediately set up his own practice, and they sort of helped each other. My father took care of the DPs, and Herb took care of the American, office, American soldiers. And um, there are several stories, of, before I mention that, as I said, my parents um, were not yet married. They married in the United States, but Herb and his parents sponsor my parents to come to America, which was a big deal back then, and found them jobs and, 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 and supported them financially, or, or agreed to for, uh, support them financially if they couldn't make their own way, which they didn't need that help, but just knowing that it was there mm -hmm. was crucial. So um, there are several stories in the book that I don't really have time to go into, but um, there are many interesting stories about how this very green army doctor, green to the army and green to being a doctor, and this uh, war-weary war um, hung Hungarian doctor with 10 or 15 years' experience um, um, help each other out, including one story where um, um, uh, that Dr. Lichtman needed a refrigerator for his vaccines, and through my father and other people, ended up in the displaced persons camp where a person named Henry Packner, who was the, uh, one of the DPs and, and um, um, was the commander of the self-governed camp, uh, but also ran the largest black market uh, in, in all of Eschwege, Germany, got him the refrigerator. And th those three became lifelong friends. And, and I saw them. I saw Dr. Lichtman at least twice a year. And I saw Henry several times. He you know, lived in Europe. He, visited us and we visited them. And that's so nice. I know later on you have a photo of them together. Yes, yes. And, I think I um, might have that here. Oh, everyone that. loves a good love story, right? Yeah. So uh, also in the book is a real sweet story about uh, your dad and your mom. Yes, this is my mother, um, Perla Schlesinger. She went by Peppy. And um, this is a photo of the two of them together in Germany. Um, during, during that four years they lived in Germany. So I'll read you from the book. My father met my mother, Perla or Pepe Gutter, a fellow DP in the camp through his medical practice. He needed a typist to help him in the medical office and put out word that he would hire an experienced typist. My mother applied for the job. She told me years later that she had a crush on this handsome older doctor. He was 36 years old and she was 23. He had, she had been taken to concentration camp at age 18 with her parents and three brothers. Only she and one of her brothers survived. She had gone back to her home in Poland after liberation, but seeing that there was nothing left for her there, she made her way back to the American zone and was placed in the DP camp in Eschwege. My mother applied for the job as typist. When my mother applied for the job as typist, she said she was an excellent typist, so my father hired her. Weeks later, he learned that she had no idea how to type. She had, she had been using her salary to pay other DPs to do the typing for her. My parents eventually fell in love and decided they want to marry. Aww. And here you are, and here's the next gen. Yeah. So that was part of uh, his healing, and your mom was very smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, also part of the healing was him healing others in the camp. And it was... Imagine all that he had done before and now healing and shaping his new life, which really shaped his attitude. Um, all of it seemed to aid his healing and toward life after the war. An attitude that just included immense forgiveness, and there's a gripping story about that in your book. Yes, um, my father um, you know, was caring for all the other DPs in the camp, and um, Herb Lichtman cared for all the military personnel. And the local physicians were supposed to care for all the civilians. So between those three, um, between my dad, Dr. Lichtman, and the local civilian doctors, everybody should get medical care. Um, but Dr. Lichtman um, um, mentioned that some of the civilian d uh, doctors came to him and said they didn't want to take care of the civilians who were former Nazis or Nazi sympathizers. Um, because they were afraid of being associated with them and didn't want to have it hurt their reputation. And, uh, Dr. and that would Dr. Lichtman take care of those people too? And he said, I can't. The government 
only allows me to take care of the soldiers. And when my father heard the story, he, he, decided, he said, I'll take care of them. He said that, excuse me. He explained that if the Nazis could take away his um, empathy and make him break his hypocritic oath, they would truly have defeated him. Right. Yep. Touching story. That's forgiveness. That's forgiveness. So we will now bring him to the U.S. So as we mentioned earlier, Joe Schlesinger was designated the official 10,000th DP to arrive, and it was captured in this story by, you look at the byline, is that a familiar name? Um, so another twi in another twist of synchronistic fate, tell us about this. Yeah, he was on his ship, uh, the USS uh, Ernie Pyle, uh, which was a transport ship. There were 599 uh, DPs, and of course they didn't give everybody a number, but they knew that, that with these 599, they would go over the 10,000th mark of DPs emigrating to the United States. So they chose my father. I don't, he didn't think it was random. He thinks it's because he spoke English, not with a very thick Hungarian accent and with very poor grammar, but still uh, spoke English. And he had an interesting story. And um, many Americans were afraid of uh, mass immigration of refugees. They were afraid they would take their jobs. And um, so my father um, likely just represented the type of um, a refugee that might be embraced by all Americans. He, he was a doctor. He already had a job. He did, wasn't depending on government resources. And um, also, just um, his story of survival might appeal to their uh, compassion for the Holocaust survivors. And so when he arrived, he ended up coming off the ship, and there were a string of newspaper reporters ready to interview him. And one of them was uh, Ed Sullivan, as you see here. And so uh, he um, was interviewed by them all and ended up in the newspaper and made a big, big splash and um, didn't expect any of that. And um, there were some repercussions back in Hungary when he made some comments or answered some questions about the Hungarian government that I discussed in the book. They also made some for interesting uh, reading. Yeah, it's amazing to me that you have this article. I mean, what a find. What a fine and I have all the other newspaper articles, too, and, and three of them are in the book. They're in the book. Yeah. They're in the book. Okay, you go on in your book to tell how your parents stayed in New York for only a few months before they moved to Boston, where your father completed another medical residency, and then ultimately to New Hampshire. And that group of New York friends, in a way, became a family for your parents, right? Yes, it's definitely the case. I mean, I, I remember as a child never seeing them happier than when we went to New York every year on winter break of, of school. And we spent every, every um, uh, December, late December and early January um, with all these friends. And these were friends he had made um, in the DP camp because they were other survivors. Or they were people like Dr. Lichtman, who we saw, who went back to New York and became the chief of uh, oncology, I'm sorry, chief of uh, hematology at, NYU, at uh, Downstate New York. Uh, medical school, and so we saw both friends of his who had been refugees, and and also people like Herb Lichtman, and this this was a really tight knit group. Um, even though we left the New York area and the rest of them stayed, we still stayed. They were like our family, and um, they they were all they were all uncle and aunt to me. They they were. I think I have some pictures, and here are some of our New York friends with my father there in the middle. And these are people I grew up with as, as relatives. I mean, they were uncle and aunt, Ruth and Hans. And, and um, they, they all helped each other. They helped each other get jobs. They helped each other learn about the new ways in the new country. They learned, but they also kept their old traditions together. Um, and so they had a shared sense of deep gratitude also to the United States that they all felt that uh, America had saved them. Right, and I think you have another photo after this one with the friends. Yes, and that's Henry Packner, who, as you can tell, is the guy you would have expected to have run the black market <laughs> with a cigarette and a cigarette holder. And, uh, and uh, at an apartment when we visited him where he lived in Malaga, Spain, and we had another apartment that he wouldn't let us pay for and he wouldn't tell us 
how he got that either, you know, because <laughs> he knows people. He said, I know people. And, he, and, and, he, and, he, and, we, and so, um, so, yeah, these friends were friends for life. Huh. And, um, and, um, and they were all very hopeful when they got to the United States. And, and, and then that's... eventually my parents started their own family. My sister was born first, and then I was born, and, and they had five grandchildren. And one of them's here tonight. Yeah, right. Madeline. So you said something that leads right into our, our next and, and actually our final, final question before we go into Q&As, Q's and A's, is hope. Use the word hope and gratitude. And what I love about this book is in the back, amidst all the history, which is just phenomenal, all the photos and everything, is the last part, part five, lessons from my father's life. And Al just does a beautiful job articulately, articulately writing about the lessons. And I would love for you to share those with us yeah. now. Yeah, when, when I finished, I, um, I remember finishing and they came to America and I was, my sister and I were born. And then I just sort of thought there's something missing. And then I realized I really had to talk about really what I learned from my dad, the, the stories uh, of his survival and, and how he, he survived, not f only physically, but emotionally, w was the real reason. And so I really wanted to summarize that at the end of the book with those, those um, lessons. And I talk about importance of family. I mean, it started when he, he um, faced what he knew was a futile attempt to save his parents and knew what was going to be the consequence of him not escaping before the war reached Hungary. Um, just dramatic um, example of importance to fa of family to my dad. And friends were the same thing. It was not, not only the people like the, the, the refugees um, who became our New York family, but also the people who had um, helped him come to, to America. And um, just also gratitude, gratitude for surviving and, and not just surviving but gratitude for the, the United States for giving him a new life with a new start and, and the ability to, to have a family. And that was important. And then the last of the, um, of the, the lessons I put in the, in the book were, was that just the way he celebrated life and that he was not going to dwell on the wrongdoings of the past and he was going to instead just live for the present and, and live with joy. And, and um, this picture from, of my dad, this is the main reason I brought the, my Kleenex, because I knew I'd have trouble getting through this. But um, th um, this, I found this photograph of my dad while I was cleaning up my parents' house. And, um, and it really sort of summarized to me, my dad's attitude. And I'll just read that, what I wrote in the very end of the book. As I cleaned up my mother's house in Santa Barbara in 2010 in preparation for a move to Houston, I came across a snapshot of my father. Taken in the summer of 1968, I, I believe it perfectly symbolizes his amazing survival of the ordeals of the Holocaust. He had been swimming in Lake Winnipesaukee and was climbing the ladder to come back into our boat. It was obvious that someone said something funny, something very funny. And my father is laughing so wildly that he is falling towards his right and appearing to almost be falling out of the frame of the photograph. He is filled with joy, despite the number tattooed on his arm that is clearly visible in all of the loss and pain that it symbolized. His joy cannot be contained. He is healed, healed completely, and will enjoy every moment of the rest of his life. And this is how I always remember my dad. Yeah, and there's no, uh, right. And it's no accident this last photo is in color for you tonight because it really does wrap up. I think I may get a little teary too. It really I have does. some Kleenex for you too if you need it. <laughs> I'll use my mask. But it really, it really does symbolize, I mean, this life that started you know, in such a, a way that's familiar to many of you and, the, and in a way that may or may not be as familiar to you. But the lessons he learned, the attitude he embraced, and, and 
the legacy he leaves is just really a story for all time and for this time and for all of us. And so I want to thank the Holocaust Museum again for having us here. I want to thank you, Al. I'm so glad we met walking our dogs and <laughs> Paula. You. And so thank you again. Let's go ahead and stop this. Thank you very much. So we do have some, uh, about 10, 15 minutes for Q's and A's, if anyone has any. And I think Joel is going to walk around with a mic and some wipes <laughs> to keep it clean. Um, while you're getting that ready, I have a question. When you started writing the book and then when you finished it, mm -hmm. did anything come up for you during that process? Well, I think um, one thing that was really important to me was I knew that what my father had told, what my father had experienced um, was so horrifying. And what he was able to communicate to me could only be such a tiny percentage of, of the entirety of his experience. And I was, I was starting to think that if I just passed on these stories to my kids and they passed on to their kids, just as it, the story was diluted from my father telling me, it would be diluted with each generation. And so that's why I really want to do this, because basically the dilution stops here now. I mean, my kids will be able to, you know, take this story and give it to their kids and, and each for next generation. And, and you know, that, 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 that was important to me. And, and to be honest, I want to, get to, I want to get it down in writing, but... That part of it didn't really hit me till after I was done. Yeah. That, that that it will be a living a document that will that will stop that dilution from generation to generation. And how lucky you are to have that. And how lucky you are to have that too. Thank you. Are there any more questions, David? Do you know whether your father ever came across any of his captors subsequent to his? Uh, no, I don't know of any stories like that. No, I didn't. I, the, the closest thing was the story where he was caring for some of the former Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. But I don't know if he ever dealt directly with anybody who had, who had been involved with him, with him in, during the Holocaust. All right, thank you. Yes? Oh, yes. Um, um, there's, there's a story about that in the book. He became also a lifelong friend of my father. They reconnected. In 1948, my father, the first trip he made out of Germany, after he had been on his feet for three years at that point, he visited London and visited his friend who had, his, his childhood friend who um, uh, lived in England and had, been, had gone back to England. And just like Henry Parker, or Packner, he, we knew him as Henry Parker, like, he never would tell us story, the answer to how he got us the apartment for free and how he got the refrigerator for Dr. Lichtman. Uh, Dennis didn't talk at all about what he did during the war. And um, what was really interesting to me was Hungarian accents are the hardest accents to lose. And Dennis had, Den, his friend Dennis, in, uh, who was in London, had no accent at all. So clearly... The German, I mean, the British Espionage Service has ways of training people to lose their accent. That, and that's probably the only way you'll ever lose a Hungarian accent. <laughs> if you ask my, my wife, uh, she'll tell you that she picked up a lot of every other word he, he said because his accent was so thick, it was hard to understand after 50 years. All right, thank you. You first? Uh, can you tell the story um, of your father after having escaped from the camps needing new clothes? Oh, yes. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter was one of my first readers of the book and gave me incredible uh, feedback. Um, yeah, my father, during those three weeks that he, had, between when he escaped from Nordhausen during a British bombing raid, and he was working his way west to the American zone, and the war was still going on, he ended up, um, he realized he was not getting west fast enough. And so he needed to be able to move during the day. He was only moving at night. So he decided he just had to get some clothes. He was wearing, he, was, he weighed less than 100 pounds. He um, had a concentration camp uniform. He had a tattoo on his arm. He, his head was shaved. He was clear he was an escaped concentration camp prisoner. Um, so at one point he just said, I have to take a chance. 
So he knocked on a farmhouse door, and the lady who lived there um, was very kind and said her husband had died in the war, and he, they were not Nazis. He had died on the Eastern Front, and they had taken all her clothes for donations for, you know, for, um, for the war cause, but she kept one thing, and he could have that. And so she thought, he thought that's great. So he, she came back and presented him with a uh, tuxedo with tails and a top hat. <laughs> and so here's, here's a guy trying to look inconspicuous. He thought the only thing that would make him look more conspicuous than a concentration camp uniform was this. But he took it, he threw away the hat, you know, he took it all to the woods where he'd been hiding, threw away the hat, ripped the tails off the tuxedo, um, and just rolled everything in dirt and made it look all rumpled and dirty, and it sort of looked like an, an old black suit, and, that's, <laughs> and he wore that. But again, that was pure luck. There was no, wow. there was, he, he, he could have easily have been turned in, but uh, that was an example of survival by good fortune. Wow, <laughs> great story. Yes, Paul. Al, you mentioned that your wife had a brother who survived. Yeah. Did they reconnect at all after the war? Yes, my, 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 my mother had a, uh, yeah, had a brother who survived. Her, her other two brothers and, and her parents were, were killed in, uh, in concentration camp. Yes, and they, um, they lived in Brooklyn, and we did have, we, we, we um, saw them also every time we went back to, to New York. Um, I don't know very much at all about my mother's Holocaust experience. She did not share anything. And all I know is that her brother survived. We saw him every, he was one of the people we had and saw every, every, um, every Christmas uh, vacation from school. And he just passed away earlier this year at 100. Mm -hmm. 100. Wow. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. Do you need a mic? How you talk about opportunity at all to serve, you know, at the labor camps in Russia or Auschwitz or the other? Yeah, that, that, that when he was being, um, when he was a forced laborer and they were going into Russia, he was purely a forced laborer, I mean, doing manual labor. And um, I learned, and I put in the book, a lot of the things that, um, that they were forced to do that I learned from those found documents. Um, but on the return from Russia, when the Russian offensive started, um, the, um, then it was pretty much everybody for themselves, and they, the, the, the Nazis were just returning as quickly as they could, and um, the Axis armies were returning as quickly as they could, and they actually did uh, enlist his help as a physician because there was so many medical need, there was so much medical need, and, and they didn't have enough doctors, and including, um, he did over 100 amputations for gangrene and from frostbite, um, much, many of them without um, anesthesia, and, and he, it, was a, it was a harrowing experience. And I went into more detail in the book about that, and yeah, that was very, and when he told me those stories, I could, he was a man who didn't tear up very often, but he teared up telling me that, because as a compassionate physician, um, it was very hard for him to do that, but he saved a lot of lives. Oh, wow. Anything else? Yes? You know, I, I'd like to ask, I have two stories I'd like to talk about, Alan. I'll, I'll let them play from the document over and over. <laughs> um, there's a story that you told about your dad not allowed to go back to Hungary. Oh. And how that all all went down. Yeah. Yeah, one of those articles, all of those articles in the newspaper, if you look, read a little ahead, you saw something about Cardinal Mincente. There was a Hungarian cardinal who had just been imprisoned by the Russians, because Russia, of course, in 1949, had, for the last four years, had made uh, Hungary a, um, a satellite country at that point. And this Cardinal Mincente was very uh, outspoken against the Russian government, and so they had arrested him and tried him for treason. And they tried to say that he was a Nazi sympathizer. That's why. Well, he spoke out against the Nazis during the war, and he spoke out against the Russians after the war, and both got him in trouble. And so one of the things, when, when my dad landed and was, had microphones thrust in front of him from all these newspaper reporters, 
Cardinal Vincente had just escaped from the Russians into the American embassy. And the Russians wanted him back, and they said he was uh, a Nazi and he had supported the Nazis. And so because my dad was Hungarian, and this cardinal was Hungarian, and it was the hot topic of the day. If they had a 24-hour news cycle like we do now, that's what they were talking about. And they asked him, one of the questions they all asked him was, do you think Mincenti was a Nazi? And he said, no, everything I heard from my Catholic friends was he was a very good person. And I heard from many of my Jewish friends that he helped a lot of the Jews. Well, because of that, my father was tried in absentia by the, um, by the um, Hungarian government and, and uh, found guilty of treason and sentenced to death. And, and so he was very nervous about going back. And, um, and, um, but finally, as uh, my friend Bill asked me about the story, he wanted to go back because he, um, he wanted to take us to Europe and to his home country. So he went by himself first after ch checking with a friend of his who happened to be a congressman from New Hampshire. Um, we lived in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is a small state. And my father was a great bridge player, and Chester Murrow was a great bridge player. And they met, and they knew each other well. And, Doc, and Mr. Murrow then had, had not, no longer was a congressman, but worked in the State Department. And so he, through back channels, checked and made it, made it checked out that it would be safe for him to go back. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, had, they, had, they were not upset about this anymore in 1966. So he went by himself. Next year, we all went. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, I, I went, it was very interesting. I went to, we went to Hungary in 67 after my father tested the waters in 66. And, um, and that was during the peak of the, uh, just before the buildup to the, um, the um, Czech uh, revolution and so tensions were high and um, but uh, we spent a month in Hungary and a month in the rest of Europe including seeing Henry Parker and Dennis Langford the, all these other friends and it was a little it was strange to go back to my father's hometown and see his old house where he and his dad had their medical practice as well as where they lived and um, I mentioned this in the book I stress that he said so little or nothing about the, the war before he sat me down when I was 20, and so little after. But I do talk in the book about the only time I ever heard him say something sort of negative or was when we were walking down the street. At one point, he said, when I walked down the street with my parents, um, all the people, when we went off to concentration camp, all the people lined the streets and laughed and jeered at us. And now I'm coming back as a successful American doctor with a family and a new life, and now it's my chance to laugh at them. Mm -hmm. And that was the only, that was but the only negative thing I ever heard him say ever. Wow. So it's funny you ask that, and I, I tell that story in the book, too. Boy, that's gratitude, isn't it? And forgiveness, which is mm -hmm. such, a, two such prominent yeah. themes in your book. And I think if there are no other questions before we go out and you can meet Dr. Schlesinger and perhaps get a book and have him sign it. In the back of the book, one of my favorite ways to close this will be something that you write about gratitude. <clears throat> there are three wonderful stories here. The third one is wonderful and it has to do with Madeline and an experience at UT where she worked with a professor who the experience with the professor created closure for this professor whose father was a liberator of Nordhausen and who struggled with PTSD after that, right? And for Madeline, the granddaughter of Joe, to be able to talk about a survivor and show the results of survivorship created incredible closure for this professor. And that's so touching to me. Um, and before that, and this is an, a tribute to you, Al, I close with this. When he talks about gratitude, he says, my parents never lost their sense of gratitude for the country that gave them a new life, a life with the freedom to live without persecution 
and the opportunity to make a better life for themselves and their children. They appreciated everything good about their new country, a land where everyone has a chance. They always sympathized with those who were oppressed and were strong supporters of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. We took part in a convoy of cars driving from all over New Hampshire to a church in Manchester to support Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington. My parents were also very proud that I took a military scholarship through medical school and served for four years in the U.S. Air Force. So Al, you paid it forward. You're paying it forward now for all of us. Thank you again so much. And oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Al.